It's time for another edition of AEW Unrestricted. We are the official podcast of All Elite Wrestling. It's Tony Schiavone along with... Aubrey Edwards. What's up, Tony? What's up, Aubrey? How you been? I'm okay. I'm in Orlando traveling around with my podcast equipment again so you can sit with your lazy ass at home in your bat cave. Yeah, with Just my dog. Just want to remind you how much I love you. I appreciate <laughs> that. I always ask you how you are, but I see you every week, so I should know by now how you are. I give you a big hug at work. It's great. Yeah, there you go. We are, we're very excited about having Pat Buck with us. How are you doing, Pat? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Tony? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Um, uh, Pat is uh, head trainer at Creative Pro Wrestling Academy, wrestling pro founder, Jedi mind trick master in wrestling, a suit <laughs> aficionado, but more importantly, he is an AEW coach and behind the scenes, one of the guys that makes things happen. Pat, it's great to have you here. Uh, we just had Sanjay on the podcast. We thought that you uh, might do suits better than he does. Yeah, uh, I think he learned from me. He, <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he admitted that his wife helps him with his suits. What's your story? How did you master the art of, of suits backstage? I think it goes further back than suits backstage. I mean, my whole life, I went to like prep school. So from, the, from first till 12th uh -huh. grade, I was wearing a shirt and tie. Got so it. it was kind of just used to me. And when I first started wrestling, this sounds incredibly fanboyish or looking back kind of, I don't want to say I want to make fun of this, but I remember reading in early on, right around when I was starting to wrestle that, you know, Flair would show up to every show dressed up. And I think it was yeah. in his book. Right. And I used to go to indie shows with a dress shirt and slacks and the tie and just kind of, always stuck with it i kind of feel comfortable with it and then in my later years you know people start getting married when you start getting a little bit older and i never wanted to wear the same suit to a wedding and then when i got a job that required suits i went all in i don't have many vices and i'm really you know i'm upsetting my wife with the amount of shirts and ties and this is my thing this is my vice so got it I became a suit guy there i mean go. at least the write-offs right so you got that going for you I, yeah, I, I guess so. I think it's, it's a little obnoxious. Well, and I'm always looking for a deal. I don't go custom. I don't go <laughs> too above my means. I'm hunting on every, you know, Poshmark and, and dis, not discount, but I'm on the hunt for a good deal. I, I never go retail. So yeah. that's you're, my, you're, that's my you're story. waiting for, waiting for men's warehouse to have one of those great two for one deals. You Got never it. know what you find. You can find a lot. Actually, the first story is I was dead broke. Gosh. And, you know, even 10 years into wrestling. And one of my buddies, uh, one of my best friends was getting married. And I kind of freaked out because at that time, I didn't really have any suits. I didn't have any money whatsoever. And I'm like, oh, gosh, um, I, I need to go get a suit. And I went to the Salvation Army because I just had this theory. OK, I'm a Queens kid, Long Island. I bet you there's a lot of posh people out there that just give their suits away. And I found this killer DKNY suit, for 30 bucks. And from there, and of course, when I wore people, oh, that suit, is that custom? And I'm like, oh, okay, so you can pull this off. And that, that's where it all starts. <laughs> so, you know, now I, I, can, I can, I don't have to go there anymore, but that's legitimately where the suit yeah. obsession starts. I think uh, I want to follow up on this, Aubrey, because I know you have the next question. Uh, since, since Pat and Sanjay arrived, uh, it is kind of, I, I've tried to up my game. Uh, in other words, I use... I used to just wear the Tommy Bahama stuff backstage, but now I try to get into my tie of uh, getting ready for TV as soon as I get there. Because I, I don't know. I, I just think it's good. I just I just like it backstage. I think it it shows that you are professional. I don't know why. And, well, and you know what? coming here. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry to cut you off, but coming okay. here, it's just like, I almost felt like people are like, what are you doing? Right. You don't yeah. do that anymore. <laughs> right. Uh, and it's, I don't want to say discouraged, but I'm just like, no, like this is kind of, you know, I, I do, I, I'm not trying to, I feel comfortable in this. Like I would feel really weird, you know, trying to give direction or get certain sort of job done. If I'm, if I'm wearing a, a tank top or, a, you know, a, a, even a polo shirt feels a little mild for me, maybe at a AW dark when it's very, very hot, but like, it's, uh, it's just something that, you know, um, I think QT said, he's like, he's like, you don't have to do this anymore. Like, stop. I'm like, no, 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 I'm, I'm doing this. <laughs> you, you're not going to stop me. So me yeah. and Sanjay have committed to the suits and good. That's the way it's going to be. 
I uh, I've stepped up my game too. Instead of showing up to work in workout gear, I actually wear like street clothes. So okay. maybe not to the full level, but I have gone one level up. So thank you to you and Sanjay for oh. kind of encouraging a little bit of caring in that regard. Heck yeah, I like it. Great. There we go. All right, enough about suits. Uh, cause we learned about the beginning of suits, but I want to learn about the beginning of AEW cause you've only been with us for, for a couple months now. How did, how did right. that whole thing start? So it's been about three months now and, or a little bit longer. And I feel since AEW's inception that I've had this like unofficial working relationship with AEW and with Tony. And it's always been interesting because, uh, my, I never really thought after, chasing wrestling so long and not having not having the tv contract sort of success as a performer that i would be completely working for myself the rest of my career and i was fine with that because around you know i started in 2001 about 2011 comes and i've i've been wrestling pretty much full time everywhere and anywhere but never really got that opportunity to to really cement something so i said screw this and i'm gonna put on a show and become a promoter and luckily that worked out and opened my schools and i just figured that oh, well that's what i'd be doing the rest of my life and i was fine with that totally i could rest i could if i want to wrestle somebody i'll book him and wrestle him i was basically a kind of a you know some people said a, a poor man's jerry lawler of new york like it's just this is my area <laughs> i'm running you know 30 to 50 events a year in the new york new jersey area i got my schools but then my students started getting really noticed a lot and primarily and only by AEW. Even when I worked at my former place, it was the, the act of getting independent wrestling talent seen and getting them into the system. They had different requirements. But Tony and, and, and I, I guess, kind of value talent in a similar light where we see things, you know, and I didn't know him. But, you know, you started seeing him. You saw MJF. You saw... Uh, the acclaims, Chris Statlander, you know, now I'm just, I'm bragging, Bear Bronson and even Swart Mark Sterling. So I'm like, there's seven of my kids, six or seven of my kids over there. Yeah, we call them kids that it, it I just, I'd see what they're doing. And I think that's awesome. But I never had any, an official talk or dare I say with Tony with, of course, all tons of people I've worked with. I've worked with most of the roster here in some capacity before the independence or WWE, or somewhere. And Sanjay, obviously, um, we worked with not just at WWE together. We we had a long-standing relationship before that, promoting shows together, working together, producing shows together. Then, you know, uh, I've never really said the story, but I, I offered my, or submitted my release on a Monday morning post-WrestleMania uh, before Raw, right. and I was on the plane ride back. And a uh, certain talent, you know, texted me, hey, you know, uh, Tony would like to speak with you on Wednesday. So uh, I guess you can say it was a short 12 hours or 12 to 20 hours or maybe a little bit longer, maybe 24 hours. I can't do the math in my head of going from one place to another, which is pretty wild. But it, it's the yeah. greatest thing that's ever happened to me. Yeah, I think it's one of the I think it's one of the great stories that was not that did not leak out. That you, think. you were in WrestleMania, and then all of a sudden on Wednesday, here you are here. <laughs> and I thought for sure everybody would know about it, and no one knew about it. That's such I mean, a, is, isn't it amazing? Amazing, because in certain capacities, I, I assume the moment I walk in, okay, it's going to be out there. Right. And I also thought, like, you know, and I think people would assume that, you know, when I uh, quit WWE, that it was because of, I didn't have this lined up. That, that's that's I did I hope in my heart that I'd be here for sure. sure. Should I hope that, you know, uh, Tony would recognize this and maybe there's a thing there. But I took a gamble on myself. And, you know, I think that by um, by just what what happened and, and but and being here like it, it didn't get out for quite a while. So I was kind of shocked. And that that goes to show you the different kind of respect people have in the locker room. I'm like, even it was actually kind of funny, even the extras, you know, that were booked that day. Some of them were booked for that I booked for WrestleMania and the shows like a week ago. And they, they walked in there like, what the heck is this? <laughs> so credit to our locker room for not really, you know, um, for having that, you know, respect. It got out a couple weeks later, but 
that that shocked me, and I thought that was a cool thing. Yeah, we have, we have so many Stooges backstage in in the There's wrestling so business. In the in the <laughs> wrestling, I'm saying in the wrestling business uh, that I thought for sure, and then I didn't see it till after a week later that mm-hmm. Pat Buck was working with us. So I thought it was an amazing story, Aubrey, in itself. It was, it was. And, you know, I feel like it's one of those things that's inevitable. I feel like half our roster is either Chikara or Creative Pro. So <laughs> might as well just, <laughs> it, it, it was only inevitable that Pat was going to show up eventually. So uh, absolutely crazy to think that like, oh yeah, just 24 hours later, hey, you're with us now. It's great. Right. But y- y- you've got one of those great minds and having had the chance to work with you a little bit so far, I'm like, man, we have benefited so much from having Pat here. So I'm very happy that you made the jump. I appreciate that. So, yeah, it was one of those things. Like, I, I really, throughout the whole process, especially when I knew I was going to leave WWE, and I knew for, for a while. Um, and it was really because of schedule, like, primarily. But I, right. like, I always wanted to, I wanted to be here. But there was no official thing. Um, but, however, there was randomly, I said, you know what? I emailed Tony uh, months ago. I never, I didn't hear back, but I was just like, hey, I just want to let you know that you've done more. AEW has actually done more for me in terms of my reputation in pro wrestling than actually WWE has. And that's weird to say because they did take care of me for, for three years. And, and it was a, you know, I look back and as a positive experience. But the fact of, I don't know, the fact that the talent are here that came, that came, that I produced or trained, whatever you want to say, uh, just meant the world to me. So th- this is home. I feel like this is what it meant to be. And when this was early on, you know, AW was starting. This was the place that uh, there were there were talks early on, and it was like right around the time that I took the job with WWE. It just wasn't, you know, things were just so much things were happening here that I ended up, you know, going to WWE. But um, I'm so glad that that happened because now. I feel like um, my my toolbox or my skill set is extremely sharpened in terms of production and structure and a lot of things like that. Now I get to be here with everybody and just do my best to try to make this a little bit of a better place. We are talking with Pat Buck. You're listening to AEW Unrestricted. We got a lot more to talk about his background with Creative Pro and a great story that you won't want to miss from the road when we continue on Unrestricted. Mm-hmm. This is Aubrey and Tony at AEW Unrestricted. We are talking to Pat Buck, recent hire at AEW, one of the awesome coaches we have backstage. He's he's a trainer. He's a promoter. He's a Jedi. He's a father. He's he's a ginger. He's all of these wonderful things. <laughs> and we now get to benefit from his awesomeness. So mm. we we we've obviously talked a little bit about your involvement with Creative Pro. Um, let's let's talk about that because you had said you know you're wrestling for about ten years and then. Started up Create a Pro in New Jersey. Uh, why did why did you decide to go around opening the school, and how did Brian Myers become involved with all that? So interesting enough, and I try to everything I coach and everything that I, I like to teach, it comes from failure, and I go don't make these mistakes. So if I look back, this is what I would have done instead. I started in two thousand one, and with that being said, I feel like. 2001 maybe gosh i don't know all those next years are probably the worst time in professional wrestler wcw was you know going away ecw was essentially going away and there was i wasn't exactly familiar with the independent scene and i don't even think the independent scene at that time was something that it is today so once i started getting training and bouncing around my first huge opportunity came was i was invited to uh, WWE's developmental system, OVW, uh, by Jim Cornette. Uh, but it was more of those, it was one of those things where I had a tryout camp and he's like, look, you're, at the time, I think I was like 18 or 19. He's like, hey, uh, no promises, but I think you have something. You work on your body, you train here, you know, you figure out what you're doing. I'll use you on TV to, you know, put over guys essentially to just whatever. And who knows, something could happen. And that's all I needed to hear, and I moved immediately to Louisville. So I thought I'd be this contracted TV superstar. Again, WWE was really the only game in town, 2005-ish, at least in my opinion. 
And I was obsessed with OVW because it was seven days a week of wrestling. It's like the only territory that, to me, the only territory that existed. I loved independence, but I felt like I didn't fit in from 2001 to 2005. Like, I remember, uh, I've always been kind of a, cla- I don't want to say classical, but a traditional wrestler. And I remember I just yeah. felt like there was, there was a time that I was on an independent show in New Jersey. And I was being heckled for wearing trunks because I was the only person on the show wearing trunks. And I went, what's going on here? Do I not fit in? Is it, it's, it just felt strange to me. And two days, you know, two shows a week wasn't enough for me. So I got the invite to OVW. A lot of times if you got in that position, you work your butt off, you get your body right, you train with all the, the contract talent, and here's your opportunity. Well, things changed and different people stepped in. So what was could have been one year ended up being four and a half years, and I'm still unemployed. I'm bouncing. I'm going to college in the morning. I'm taking out student loans to pay for my training to be a wrestler, but I'm still doing seven days a week of wrestling. And I went, man, like this is like, am I a loser? Like, like, man, what? Like, can someone just can <laughs> someone just tell me that I'm horrible so I can just go home? But it was always like, hey, no, you're doing everything right. You're doing everything right, and that's a big thing for wrestlers, like. Well, I keep hearing I'm doing everything right. Maybe you are. It's timing. It's just something. And then the deal with WWE got plucked and went to Tampa. And I went, okay, I'll move home. I'll, I'll go back to New York. I'll, I'll figure out something. And my friends in the system and friends in the company were like, we think you should move to Tampa. I'm like, I don't know, guys. Like, no, no, no. It's a brand new system. Maybe you could help out down there. And I did. So I followed the WWE train to FCW. Hmm. And I basically joined a class that you had to actually pay for and i because this was a new crop of people that i didn't know i knew dr tom pritchard very well since i started but there was a steve kern and a norm smiley and wow. guys i've never met before sure. so i paid for this beginner program and just to make it a little bit of a shorter of a story by the end of this program i was helping coach the program with norman and with that and they were like look we'd like you to be in in here and they they thought more those guys norman steve dr tom in that short year that i was there tried to get me hired and the whole pitch was you know hey even if you don't think pat's a star you need him in the system to work with the people that you do think are stars it's still fall on deaf ears um wasn't happening then an idea to to relate to you aubrey pat could be a referee but he's a little bit too muscular. Can he trim down? Okay. Uh, dropped 25 pounds. I was about to do a couple of things, uh, tryouts as a referee. And then that changed to, well, you're going to go out there and wrestle uh, a couple dark matches and that's it. And then, so I just gave up and I said, that's it. Let me move back home and uh, started working indies again, and I was frustrated again because now I have all this incredible training, and I've worked with so many people, so many brilliant minds, like at that time, Cornette and Heyman, and, and the whole OVW system, and FCW with Dusty, and full-time wrestler for this whole amount of time. And I'm in, I can't get the opponents I want to get. I can't. Nobody knows who I am because I never had TV. So why would you care about me? Why would you feature me? So I said, you know what? I'm either going to go back to school to, to I'm going to go to medical school or I'm going to put on one show and I put on one show and, and put everything I had into it. And luckily I had 900 people there and I went, Oh, okay. Well, then that's, that's kind of a big deal. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and it was, you know, I, I, I was, I had a partner at the time, but we, we booked some pretty big acts and we figured out the finances and I learned a lot from him at the time. Because I was a wrestler guy, I knew how to book a show, I knew how to do all these things. I've done it before, but I didn't know things about event rent, rent like renting a venue and insurances, chair rentals and equipment. And where do we like? So I had to learn all that stuff. But then you know, one show, then we did another one. Was, okay, just a little bit more, and then this third show, I fell flat on my face and you know lost a ton of money. <laughs> then I, I realized looking at it because I've always kind of been a numbers guy and I think and, and a budget guy, and I think me and uh, TK kind of relate on that capacity because I look at something I go okay what what would solve this I need to get my own equipment and I want to I'd always want to have a school just to work at it but also if I train my own guys I can replenish this roster and costs will go down 
And that's where it spawned from. So it was a business kind of thing. And I thought it'd be fun. And also tr- all, you know, as far as, like I said, I'm not the most, most wrestling fans, even probably listening, don't know who I am. Maybe they've read a little things, but mainstream, nobody. But I've spent more time in wrestling training academies and dojos and probably than any person I've ever met wrestling. And, and it's scary. Mm-hmm. So I felt pretty uh, confident. Let me try a school. I opened up the school in the Rahway Rec Center, where is the same where is the place where Jersey All Pro used to do shows. There's a five year break. Then I stepped in, and then first I had you know ten students, and my friends tried to talk me out of it. They're like, "Look, man, I think you're gonna fail. We think you'd be great at it, but why would anyone want to train with you? You know, there's Hall of Famers that have schools. There's those those aren't up. very good friends. <laughs> well, it's funny because they normally are so encouraging, and I went, I just got to try. And word of mouth spread. And the reason why I think a lot of the, the, and it's a selfish reason, but like my school, I got to stay in shape all the time because I'm wrestling the kids. I'm wrestling my, my students and literally in the ring. No, no, no. This trail is wrong. Do this. Here's what you do here. And word of mouth spread. And people started seeing how talented people were after three months. And they're at another school for five years and they can't get through a five minute match. So the school started growing, 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 growing. And then, uh, Brian Myers, you know, is a lifelong friend of mine. We kind of broke in together. I was a little before him and he was on re, uh, doing, um, I don't know if he's like on an injury or just wasn't on the road. And he drove from New York to my school. He's like, man, I love your school. It's fun. It's this, that, the other. And we came from the same school, uh, the NYWC, which was in Long Island at the time. Uh, and I was like, Hey, do you want to, Let's just open one. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah, I'll, I, I'm doing well here. I, let's do a school in Long Island. So we're from, but why not? And we opened the second school. So now, you know, when I'm off the road with AEW, I'm trying to spend one night at my New Jersey school and one night at my New York school training, coaching, while, you know, I feel bad that my wife is taking care of our baby. But it's like, hey, I, I want to keep these businesses afloat. So that's how it kind of tied together with, with Brian and they say don't work with your friends, and I think that's nonsense because we've that's been bullshit. Yeah, it's been wonderful having him as a partner and seeing what we've created together at Creator Pro. You mentioned your friend uh, in past. Were you talking about Kevin Matthews earlier? Yeah, yeah, yes. Because he keeps Creator Pro running, right? When you're doing other things, right? He does. He's actually that's the thing too. Is that again working with your friends? Like it. It was now that I've been able to, you know when I started to, man, I I physically can't be here anymore. Uh, Kevin Matthews is my booker man, my, my person that kind of steps in and does everything day to day in terms of that. And we have, you know, I think for WrestlePro, I want to say this year, we're probably going to have about 25 events for creator pro. Maybe there's about 12 or so. So while I'm not there, at least my, between the two promotions, we have, you know, close to 40 events. So I've been very, happy that i can lean on a crew and taught him how to promote book do all these different things while i'm there if i'm around if i'm not i'm off the road of course i'll be there but he keeps everything afloat and he keeps everything going and he was uh he was just on tv this week company with dan lambert and scorpio sky uh on AEW programming so he uh he does a great job yeah and working with pat closely like i do and it's been tremendous to be honest with you being able to work with you and sanjay and and qt and Ace and all you guys. I, uh, we were in Savannah, and uh, this past week as we're recording, and Pat said, "Oh, uh, came to us. I think it was in the morning. We got a text. Pat said, uh, I can't, uh, I can't find my rental car. Uh, <laughs> it's been stolen. What? Yes, that's what he said. And we went, No, really? From the from the hotel? Yes, it's been stolen." Uh, and I can't find my keys. So I'm thinking, well, he locked, he left his keys in his car and someone stole it. He called the police. You're pacing me in a bad light. I can't wait to, <laughs> I, I can't wait to counter this. Okay. <laughs> okay. You call the police, the police gets involved and you can pick up the story from there. Sure. So a little bit <laughs> b- before I'm painted as an absolute <laughs> idiot. <laughs> You're not an absolute idiot. <laughs> There's a little more to this. Okay. I, I land the night before and right. our you know, not breaking the fourth wall. I'm with, uh, Dan Hauser was on my flight. Okay. And I was like, Hey buddy, hop in the car. Let's go. And I remember we pull up to the hotel, you get the parking ticket that allows you to get into the garage. We park the car. 
And I distinctly remember having the keys in my hand. So I pop the trunk, we get our bags out, close the trunk. Now, to be perfectly honest, I don't remember having the keys after that. But Uh, let's just see what happens. We check in, et cetera, et cetera. Like Tony said, the next day I wake up, ah, where's the rental key? Can't find it, can't find it, can't find it. Man, did I leave the keys in the car? I go down the car and it's not there. And then I'm like, okay, maybe I parked in a different spot. Maybe I'm not remembering things. I asked Dan Owls, and he's like, no, 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 you, this is where you park. So, yeah, um, the hotel manager came out. We walked through every single parking spot on the premise where it could possibly be. And I'm like, look, the car is gone. And she's like, well, you should keep looking for the key. I'm like, we're way past that. The car is not here. And that's, that's that. So I do call the police. We follow the port, et cetera. And finally, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I keep trying to figure this out. And I call the police later and they're like, no, we're reporting it stolen. And of course, they're like, did you leave the keys in the car? And I go, no, I definitely didn't. I'm like, I think I might have put them on the hotel desk or fell out of my pocket. But I don't know if I left the keys in the car. I don't know. So I'm freaking out, too. because like, Am I on the hook for this? You know, this is pretty bad. Right. And then yesterday, I'm just kind of sitting around. And I have this thought that just kind of hits me. And I went, hold up, like a, a, a new theory happened. Because also in that parking lot, I remember Christopher Daniels. And I can say this because it's actually unrelated. He had the same exact rental car type that I had. It was a blue mm-hmm. Dodge Challenger. Right. So, and I knew that was his car because I was trying to, I was like, is this my car? But I could see there, his agreement. I saw his name and I was like, okay, that's Chris's car. But then I thought, wait a minute. This is what happened. Mm. Somebody there, and it, we still don't know, could be one of the boys, mm-hmm. could be someone staying at that hotel, mm-hmm. had the same exact blue Dodge Challenger as me, mm-hmm. came out, thought that where I parked was where they parked. So now mm-hmm. they get into the car. I left the keys. I left it unlocked. I think the keys might have fell into the trunk, or I just probably left them in the console. Mm-hmm. Now they can start the car because my keys are in the car, and they're driving around that runner car thinking it's their own Mm -hmm. so and i know this because the car was returned to the airport yesterday at three (laughs) o'clock so now this poor person and i and i kind of hope it's one of the boys now it wasn't chris because chris is like no no no, i'm fine but there was a couple blue challengers at Mm -hmm. at at the at Mm -hmm. the airport so now Mm -hmm. somebody has returned my car and i thank them for it but unfortunately their car is still at the hotel in savannah and they think oh that their God. they think their car is in, but they're being charged every day for this car. They are, and they, and they don't realize it. And I, I, being the good Samaritan that I am, I called up and I try to explain this to National and a car, a car rental on their on their eight hundred number, and then yeah. their local thing. And they, after ten minutes, they still couldn't understand what I was yeah. trying to tell them. So I tapped out. So they're on their own. I'm sorry. It wasn't yeah. sure. I might have messed up by dropping the keys in the trunk or leaving them there. But yeah. you took my car because you thought it was your car, and it's yeah. returned. I'm off the hook. Well, we all on the text chain yesterday for, was for sure. I thought for sure it was Christopher Daniels, and we were just laughing. <laughs> we were we yeah, we're thinking, man, this is a great story. So I'm glad it's not the fallen angel. Uh, well, it'd have been a better story if he would have been him. Oh God, that's tremendous, uh, man. That's the first time I've ever heard that, and. And I've traveled a lot. Wow. Right. This is, but it's very pro wrestling. It's very yeah. pro wrestling. It very, very. It's very, very pro wrestling. All right. <laughs> Coming up next on AW Unrestricted, we have some more with Pat Buck, including questions from fans. Stay with us. <laughs> AEW Unrestricted continues with our buddy Pat Buck, who works behind the scenes in a very, very high-level capacity, if you've seen some of the great matches on AEW. Rest assured, Pat Buck has had a hand in that, a major hand in that. Uh, Pat, uh, uh, on Instagram, uh, great pick of you is Han Solo, your wife is Princess Leia. Uh, when did your fandom start uh, with uh, Star Wars? I'm going to say this. My mother was, she always told me this, that she was, I think, seven months pregnant waiting online to go see Return of the Jedi uh, with me. Yeah. So I'm going to say that it started before I was even here, you know, that uh, it, it's just always been, you know, I'm a, I'm a 
you know, it's weird, Tony, seeing all the stuff in your background. I'm like, oh my God, me and Tony have the same exact interests. Like, the, yeah. Oh, yeah. All your, all your stuff, like, yeah, that's right up my alley. The, yeah. All the Star Wars and Marvel. And, you know, something that I felt like growing up, I had to kind of hide because I was a big athlete and, you know, kind of, but like that was to me at that time or mainstream, like, wasn't cool to admit all that stuff. But I was right. going home with the comic books and, you know, watching Lord of the Rings and watching Star Wars and, and you know, Game of Thrones, all that stuff is just still up my alley. But Star Wars, Star Wars and Batman are number one for me. Yeah. Um, I go back and forth depending on, on all those, you know, different things. But it's, uh, yeah, so my fandom just always, as, as long as I've been a fan of wrestling and stuff. And that's, that's I want to bury Sanjay Dutt here. But <laughs> with Go right ahead. With It's so funny. And even QT, I'll throw him in that because that's kind of part of yes. our... A little team is that it's so funny because they'll i've been with them before and they're like ah they don't like any of that stuff and i just don't understand as a pro pro wrestling person that's both all of us dedicated our lives to this how they don't see the correlation between storytelling or not like all that stuff it's just so funny to me but tony i'm glad you are appreciate wow. that so that that was a big thing for my wedding like we had you know our wedding cake top or was i love you i know um yeah. it just it's <laughs> I think it kind of fits my, you know, my wife and I's dynamic. It, it's the, you know, the, just that the sarcasm. And, I, and I've heard your ringtone before, Tony. Yeah. With, you know, I love like you. That. I know. Like, yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's always been, been there. And, and, you know, I'm just, uh, my one thing is, and I haven't started yet. I'm just really hoping my son likes Star Wars or likes Batman or likes all this stuff. I can't push it on him. Right. You know, but. Yeah, for sure. It's just always been that way. Yeah, I have a, I had a big Batman poster fall down yesterday. By the <laughs> way, some of those uh, command strips do not work with canvas. Okay. And I got a big hole there, and I was trying to put it up before we got on the air, but I just can't muster the light. Oh, my gosh. Around. We have the same exact lights. Yeah, yeah, I got a lightsaber on the wall. I got a bunch yeah. of Batman stuff around here. Yeah. You know, ha- it's, have, uh, you, have you ever been to the, uh, the Star Wars uh, Disney World theme park? Not yet. I was Yikes. planning on this weekend, actually, mm. or I don't know when this is airing. Uh, I want to bring my, my one thing is I want to build a lightsaber with my son. Right. But then that's, when that's I cool. Right. But I guess it's five years old and up. So like, OK, it's a little too early. OK. Yeah. I built, one, also with my, another... I built one with my grandson. Oh, you did uh, it. It's, it's a great experience. It really that's is. Awesome. It's a great experience. Yeah. What color did you go? Uh, we went with green. Oh, that's Ooh. that'd be up my alley too. Yeah. Can you build right. a Sith? Can you build a, an evil one though? A yes, you can. Crystal. Yes, you, you can. can. Okay. Yeah. That'd be more fun. Yeah. Okay. I'm not necessarily a big comic book person. I can't appreciate it, but I've got two Batman guys here and I don't know if this is a valid question. Okay. There's the comic books and then there's the movies. Like who's the better Batman actor? <laughs> so I've thought about this many times. I've fallen asleep trying to figure out this question. I have the perfect, I think I have the perfect answer. Okay. It can't be narrowed down to who's the best Batman. You have to put two categories. Okay. Who's the best Batman and who's the best Bruce Wayne? Ah. Because there's no answer for both. Mm. So to me, um, I was a big fan of, I think the best Bruce Wayne uh, was, um, <clears throat> or I think the, the best Batman, I was more of a fan of Michael Keaton for the best Bruce Wayne, I think Christian Bale. Right. I think yeah. Christian Bale lost a lot of credibility just because of the voice with the, the way he talked as Batman, Harvey right. Dent. You know, yeah. which <laughs> could have been just solved easily by having a voice modulator that was part of the gadget tree. That's what I would have done. Who am I mm-hmm. to say that? So that's the way I kind of, I separate the two. I don't know if either of you agree or disagree. I don't know if this yeah. is a topic before. Uh, I, uh, my favorite Batman was still Christian Bale. But I also like, you know, I wasn't really a fan of the bat in the latest Batman movie, but I, I didn't yeah. mind Pattinson's take on it at all. Yeah, no, I didn't either. So yeah. I, I like different interpretations. I'm waiting to see. I would love to see older Bruce Wayne, the way, you know, some like Batman Beyond and certain things like that. I just think, you know, different different takes or different things like that. But that's always my got to separate who was the best Bruce Wayne and who was yeah. the best Batman. And that was that's where I go with that. Did you did you have you watched Titans on DC on? Uh, yes. On HBO Max. Anyway, on Titans, they had an older Bruce Wayne. So yes, uh, the, that, the actor yeah. from Game of Thrones. From Game of Thrones. Name. Yeah, I forget his name too. He was I thought that was person. interesting. That seemed like a, you know, I, I aesthetically kind of took me out of it because he felt so a little bit 
too old for that time period. Yeah, but right, the right. presentation I thought was pretty good. Yeah, it's, it's a great show if you're into comic books. You go to uh, – one more question. We'll get to the fan questions. You, you go to uh, New York Comic Con. Do you get to go to any Comic Cons? I've been there before, and yeah. it's a little overwhelming for me. I just wow. feel like I'm um, – you know, um, I, I don't I, – I just like having the, the movies at home, and, and the, the, uh, I have no problem going and checking out all this stuff, but I've never really been much into – any of the memorabilia, like I like the posters and stuff like that. It's more, I think the the creative part of it and all the different films and stories and things like that are, are more up my, up my alley rather than, you know, um, meeting the individual people or, you know, going to things like that. And I like New York Comic Con was just so wild that, uh, but, but I'm always open to it. It, it seems... I'm just happy, like I said, I'm happy that this is cool now. When go growing up, it was like you had to hide your comic book or yeah, right. or your, you know, oh, I can't, even with wrestling, I kind of had to, it wasn't exactly the coolest thing when you're in third grade and you're, you know that, you know, you know every, <laughs> every Ric Flair victory for a championship and you're reading the magazines, but you don't want your friends to know about it. Right. It's, it's just funny how all that stuff is embraced and that's great. Yeah, it's good stuff. Man. All right. All right. We're going to rein it in, you nerds. All, All right. right. We got fan questions. <laughs> the hell? I know. I'm, I'm calling you nerds, but, you know. Okay, I'm go just, ahead. My fandom's elsewhere. Anyway, uh, we got a question from All Elite Matt on Twitter. Who from your wrestling school would you like to see appear on AEW who hasn't yet already? You know, when I hear appear, you know, a lot of them have done AEW Dark. Mm-hmm. But when I hear that, I kind of look at it in in terms of who could be the next person that could follow in the paths of the acclaim, the MJF, the Statlander and that whole crew. Uh, there, uh, there's a guy named Bobby Wayward. He was one of my first original students. I feel like he just needs like a little bit of a break and he's an incredible, you know, talker and worker. He's someone I migrate to. I think that, you know, there's, there's, there's a couple others, and I feel like if I name too too many, that and there's actually two or three coming down for the next AW Dark tapings. But I think they just have to present themselves in a certain way. Um, Aaron Rourke has been out there in the independents, really dedicating to change his physique, an incredible personality. You know, I actually think him and Sonny Kiss would be a tremendous tag team, in my opinion. Ooh. That there's an opportunity there. Hmm. Um, he's someone that I think. It's just there, there's there's a lot there's it, it depends what the role calls for like i never would have thought or not never it was i'll take credit for it, it was my idea to tell smart smart mark sterling was training as a wrestler and i think you know I, he probably had the idea at the time but i'm like man i see you as a, as a manager and managers are being accepted again because they went away for a long time period why not and my gosh look at what He's amazing. <laughs> Look at what he's been able to accomplish right. with by doing so. It's the greatest thing ever for him. So I, I'm, I'm. There's also people there that like I've put that have been independent wrestling for a long time. That when they come to my school, I just put a fresh coat of paint on them. Hey, how about this? Two people that come to mind, and of course I'm biased. I think my booking partner KM, who's six foot five, worked Impact Wrestling. You know, I think he is a credible. Worked with him a couple times. Yeah, he's great. great. I, I would I think he'd be a solid addition to this roster. And the last one who I think would be tremendous is Falaba. He is the Filipino sumo wrestler that I, I he was struggling for a while, didn't have an identity, and I'm like, hey, I don't want to insult you, but do you like Yokozuna? He's like, I love Yokozuna. I go, What about this presentation? And that's what got him in the door at a couple companies. And I think the AEW crowd would go crazy for Falaba, this Filipino sumo wrestler. So, you know, while I didn't train him from scratch, I, I certainly kind of revamped him to give him something to go off of. I'd love to see them all here. At Ryan, Coach wants to know, what's the number one thing or lesson that you tell your students before they start training? Is there one thing? I'm going to boil it down to two things because I'm selfish. The first okay. is <laughs> some of them, and it's a, I had this talk actually this week, driving back from Rochester, stuck in traffic, but I, I went right to my school and I forgot the key to my school. Maybe this is like a running gag. This is a me. running thing for you. 
Ugh. So yeah. And but I said, you know what, guys, nice day out. Let's uh, we're gonna go on a ten minute run right now. Let's do it. And I ran with them, and it was a struggle. So the first, and I sat them down. I said, guys, I go, how many? Of, and I, I tell this to anyone signing up. I go, have you played a sport before, ever? And have you, because you can't just get off the couch and do this. You need to have some sort of physical background. I'm not saying you got to be Mr. Mr. or Mrs. Olympia, but you need to, you, you have to, you can't just go in the ring and start doing that. Your body's going to fail on you. You need some sort of aerobic activity. You know, there's, and some of them, I've had too many people sign up, say that they have, and then they're doing three rolls and they're puking or they're so blown up and they quit the first day. That's the first thing to the second ones, the ones that stay around and go, hey, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Like, it's, you're not going to be a TV star overnight. And like I said, I try to teach from failure. I'm like, it took me 11 years in wrestling just to basically break even. And it was in a role that I never really thought I'd be in. So you have to be open minded and you could get success pretty early, but even pretty early is years and years and years and just a marathon, not a sprint. So you got to stay with it. Damn, I love it. All right. Oh, this is a good question. Uh, from Go Professional Wrestling, what is the best production tip that you can give for an indie promotion to use? That's so funny. Go Pro Professional, they're the ones yeah. that... <laughs> <laughs> they're they're they, looking for tips here. <laughs> yeah, Well, are. no, what's funny is on the, the events I have, I have a production team, oh, and they've been... Cool. They're called Go Pro Wrestling, and they do all these events for Fight TV. They're fantastic people, and I think anybody, and I'll plug them, they're just, they're, they're grassroots that invest in their own equipment, learn pro, pro wrestling, and I've taken the, when I'm home and running these events on, on weekends, I'll put the headset on and basically share, you know, showing them, okay, this is where we call for an instant replay. Okay, this is what I need to tell the referee. Hey, what about this camera shot? Find their faces. So, of course, it's, it's for my own place, but I've been able to, share trickle down knowledge with this place that when they go to another promotion they can they can do all that stuff so it's funny that they're asking the question when they're like the only production but but it's also to me i tell all the wrestlers if you're booked on a wrestling show and i don't know if this relates to this question but i feel like it does don't just focus on your match like take it all in watch things see what, if you can sit in by commentary see if you can just pick up a different thing because who knows maybe you know, you could have learn enough about production. It'll make your matches better. It'll make things like that. So uh, I don't have a tip for a production team, but they're certainly, I think they asked that so I can plug them and they're awesome. So that's great. Pat, appreciate your time, buddy. I, I want to say that's great working with you. We are a better company with you with us. I can tell you that right 100%. now. 100%. For sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. No, it's been on, it's been, it's been awesome and it's just beginning and it's, it's, Great to get to work. And Tony, you were like one of the first people, if not the first I didn't know, approached me. I'm like, oh, crap. It's because I was a WCW mark. I'm like, there's Shivani. And, <laughs> and one of my college friends, I'll say this. One of my, I know he's going to listen to this. One of my college friends is obsessed with Tony Shivani. Obsessed with him. <laughs> so when he hears I work with him weekly, he, he salivates over it. He's, <laughs> he's so interested and... Mm. Um, I'm trying to get him to come to TV in Massachusetts. Oh. He might, he's, he's the biggest Tony Shivani, Shivani fanboy there is. That'd so be great. I feel, I feel like since the moment we've met, we've kind of, you know, been yeah. on the same page with everything and you've been so welcoming and, you know, yeah, I, I appreciate what both of you've done. Thanks buddy. Thanks for being with us. We've been talking to Pat Buck. You can follow him on Instagram at Twitter at Buck never stops. And here's how you can listen to this podcast. Yeah. You can listen to this podcast for free. Apple Podcasts, Spotify. I, I took it. I took it. Uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, pretty much every place where you get all of your podcasts. We have new episodes every Thursday. You can watch the video version and see Pat's amazing suit uh, Mondays on YouTube on TNT's YouTube channel. You can watch Dark on Tuesdays on YouTube. You can watch Elevation on Monday on YouTube. You can watch Dynamite on TBS on Wednesday. You can watch Rampage on TNT on Friday. <gasps> I'm Aubrey Edwards. This is Tony Schiavone. Thank you so much for listening to AEW Unrestricted.